You know, a lot of people think that the first 300 years of the church was like the golden age of Christianity. You know, the worship was pure, the teaching was biblical, and there weren't, you know, this hierarchy, there wasn't this hierarchy of priests and bishops who would oppress the faithful with all these rules, right? It was considered a golden age of Christianity. And yet, nothing could be further from the truth. That image is not true because very early on, there were ranks of churchmen and prelates and there was no Bible. There was no Bible, so these, these priests and bishops would argue viciously among themselves over doctrine. There were controversies and disputes and there was name calling and beard plucking. This is why I keep my beard so closely shaven because in the old days, men used to have these long beards and when they got mad at each other, they'd grab their beard and pluck their hairs. Anyway, not exactly, you know, a golden age, right? And also worship had kind of become kind of um, contaminated or corrupted in some places. In fact, um, St. Paul felt the need to comment on this sad state of affairs in his letter to the troubled young community on the southern tip of what is modern day Greece called Corinth. Here's what he says in chapter 11 of that letter. He says, I do not praise the fact that your meetings are doing more harm than good. What does he mean by meetings? He means Sunday worship. They're doing more harm than good. First of all, I hear that when you meet as a church, there are divisions among you. And when you meet in one place, each one goes ahead with his own supper. And one goes hungry while another gets drunk. Not exactly an idyllic picture of the early church that Paul is painting for us. Let me tell you what was going on. There was, there was an issue. And, and the issue was that for the first 300 years of the church, there were no church buildings like this beautiful church building. And so Christians had to worship in homes. They would gather in homes. Is that an alarm going off? Oh, oh it must be a car. They would gather in homes uh, of the wealthier believers. And um, they would gather there for Sunday evening worship. Uh, worship was in the evening at, in the very early days of the church. And the other thing you need to know is that they would have these big meals together and then in the middle of that meal, they would have the Eucharist. They would celebrate the Eucharist. So it wasn't just the bread and the wine. It was like a full meal. Well, what was happening was that the person who owned the big house where everybody met had a lot of rich friends. And those rich friends didn't have to work. You know, the rich don't have to work, right? They sort of have a lot of leisure time on their hands, or at least they get to control their schedule. And so they would gather early, or early in the afternoon before the official time for the service to start and they would start eating. And they would start overindulging in alcohol and they would get drunk. And then the working poor, the people who had to work all day, they would come at the end of the day and nothing would be left for them. All the food would be eaten. They were, they'd have to scrounge for leftovers. And all the rich people would gather in the dining room and so there was no room for the poor people in the dining room, so they would just go sit somewhere else in the house where there were no chairs or whatever, and they would have to fend for themselves. And this was creating division among the people. And that's why St. Paul says, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. What is he talking about? When he talks about discerning the body, he's not talking about the body of Christ that is in the elements of the bread and the wine. He's actually, in this case, talking about the body of Christ being the believers who are gathered. And he's saying, if you get together and you celebrate the Eucharist and you don't care about the poor who have to come late and you eat everything and you get drunk, you're not discerning the body of Christ, the assembly it's not just a me and Jesus, you and Jesus experience, Paul is saying. When you consume the Eucharist, you have to consider the people around you. Well, you know, we're now in this fourth week of our message series that we're calling Break Bread. 
It's all about the Eucharist and the importance of it. And we've been looking at the, the personal benefits that we get from receiving communion regularly. And so far we've said that we, we grow in greater generosity towards the poor, deeper gratitude towards God, and we get a closer connection with Christ. Those are the three benefits to us of receiving communion. We covered that in the first three weeks of the series, and if you missed any of those episodes and you wanna share them with a friend who doesn't go to church, that would be great. They're all on our website at sthillary.org. And this week we're gonna look at the fourth benefit, what we get out of receiving uh, communion regularly, and that benefit is greater unity with other Christians, greater unity in the church. Now that may seem pie in the sky based on what I just told you, right? Very early on in the early church, there were divisions. It may also seem pie in the sky because, you know, of what we're facing today in the church, right? Lots of divisions and conflict within our own church. You know, 32 years ago when I became Catholic, there were two things that attracted me to this church from my Protestant tradition. It was the Eucharist and it was the sense of unity that we had underneath a pope because we have a pope who unifies the churches around the world. And yet today, don't we find ourselves arguing and at each other's throats about the Eucharist? which is the very thing that is supposed to unite us. No, you can't, you can't give Eucharist to politicians who are pro-life, who are pro-choice. No, you can't withhold it from politicians. You can't weaponize the Eucharist. We're arguing about this, and it's getting volatile, and it could lead to a schism. Some people think that all of this could lead to a schism within the Roman Catholic Church. Can you imagine the scandal that that would create? And, jo and Jesus, at the Last Supper, the last prayer that he offered up to God before uh, he went to the cross was this. I pray that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. He prayed for unity. And to the extent that we can't get it together, his prayer was for nothing. It's a pretty sobering thought. But today, we celebrate a feast that I think brings us hope. It's the feast of the Assumption of Mary into heaven. And since the very early days of the church, people have believed, Christians have believed, that Mary, at the end of her earthly life, did not die, uh, did not suffer corruption of death, she kind of went into a dormition, a sleep. She did not die the way most people do. She was not buried in the ground, but she was assumed body and soul into heaven. And your Protestants friends will tell you that that does not, the Bible says nothing about that, and they are right. But it's been a long-standing belief in the church since at least the fourth century, and when you think about it, it makes complete sense. Think about this, Mary, was intimately connected with her son Jesus from the very first moment of his conception, and she was intimately connected with his saving ministry. She wasn't just a vessel through which Jesus came into the world. She was part of his ministry of salvation. Think about it. The angel comes to her and says, Mary, you're gonna get pregnant with the Son of the Most High God, and the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And what does she say? Let it be done to me according to your word. She assented, she said yes. If she hadn't said yes, who knows? Only God knows what would have happened. So from the very first moment of her conception of Jesus, she participated in the saving ministry. And then, as we heard in the gospel today, she goes straight down to Elizabeth's house because the angel told her that her cousin was, who had never been able to have children and was advanced in age, would, was now uh, pregnant. And so Mary takes off and she, and she goes, seems like by herself, the 90 mile trip down to where her cousin lived from, from, um, where, from the northern kingdom down to um, uh, Jerusalem, near Jerusalem, 
where her cousin lived. And when she came into the doors, she was the first prophet announcing the birth, the impending birth of the, of the Messiah. Because when she walked in, Elizabeth sensed the presence of Christ. And John the Baptist, who was, in, was conceived within her for three months, sensed the presence of Christ. And he leaped in her womb. And so Mary was the first prophet that salvation, the day of salvation, had finally arrived. And then after that, you know, she obviously gave birth to Christ. That was sort of important to be there. (laughs) She's the mother of God. And she showed Christ to the adoring shepherds who spread the word. And, And then she took him 40 days later to be presented in the temple. And then the, the prophecy by Simeon and Anna took place, prophesying that this would be the light of the nations. And then, of course, she raised him in Nazareth. Every day of his life, she was there with him. And, and she was there at his first miracle at the wedding feast of Cana, where, she turned water, where he turned water into wine upon her request. And she was at him at defining moment, with him at defining moments in his public ministry. And of course, at the end of his life, three years later, when he is suffering and dying on the cross, Mary is at the foot of the cross. Can you imagine, mothers, can you imagine watching your son, your only son, your only child, die that death for, to save humanity? She was with the apostles when they prayed after his death. Doesn't it stand to reason that at the end of her earthly life, she would be taken up into heaven, that Jesus would not allow his mother to suffer the corruption of death, but that she would be assumed body and soul and would be with him in heaven, continuing his saving ministry. And so in heaven, she does not forget about us who are here on earth who are still struggling and journeying through dangers and difficulties. You know, Mary is not a goddess. We do not worship her, but she does mediate for us. She intercedes for us because she prays for us constantly. The Bible says that there is only one mediator between God and human beings, and that's Jesus. But Mary's mediation in no way undermines that truth because she's participating in that one mediation of Christ. Just like we all do when we pray for one another. When we pray for one another, we're mediating on on each other's behalf. We're interceding for one another. Of course, Mary's prayers are exceedingly powerful and carry great weight in heaven because she was the mother of God and now stands at his right hand, arrayed in gold, as the psalm says. And because she never forgets about us, our mother never forgets about us, she is the mother of the church. And she's become the mother of unity. That's what she's interceding for us for, is our unity. She is the mother of unity, bringing all kinds of people together, not just church people, but everybody. She prays for all of us. And if you're not a church person or a religious person and you're just here on a lark or you're, you're watching on a lark and, you, and, and you're not really sure about this faith thing, I want you to know that Mary loves you and she prays for you. And even if you haven't darkened the doors of a church in a very long time, she is with us and she is our model, the model of the church, and we are here for you no matter what. Because Mary is our mother and she is your mother too and she is on our, our example of motherly care and concern for all of her children. So no matter how far away you are from the church, we are here for you always, whenever you need us. Mary is the mother of our unity. And I experienced this very profoundly in my first early days of being a priest. 2014, I was ordained a priest. And right after that, before my first assignment here at St. Hilary, I had the opportunity to go to the Holy Land on a pilgrimage. Now, if you've never been on a pilgrimage, it's a religious pilgrimage, it's an amazing thing. One of the great benefits is that you go with other believers, but you also go with a priest who is allowed to celebrate Mass on these very various altars of the religious sites that you're visiting. So in the Holy Land, the priests that were 
with us on this pilgrimage could celebrate Mass at all of these Holy Land sites. It was quite a privilege. And I went with two older, more seasoned priests and, of course, a whole group of pilgrims, about 50 people. And the seasoned priests allowed me to have the distinct honor of celebrating Mass in the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. The Holy Sepulchre is this big church that's been constructed around the very place where Jesus died on the cross. The very spot that Jesus died on the cross and the very spot where he was placed in the tomb, in the grave. And I was given that privilege to celebrate on the altar, which was the exact spot that Jesus died 2,000 years earlier. And when I got there, I realized why the older priests allowed me to have this privilege. Because it was complete chaos. Have you ever been to the Holy Sepulchre? It is complete. It is a hot mess. I'm, 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 I'm not kidding. So you go in there and, they, and, and you vest in their sacristy and they give you the, the chalice. They just hand you the chalice with everything you need. And they're like, go, Father. You have 20 minutes to celebrate Mass. And if you're not done in 20 minutes, we're going to come stop you because we've got all these groups waiting behind you. This was a disaster. I mean, you know me, a 20-minute Mass. It's like impossible, impossible. So I take the chalice. I'm like, okay, you know, and I start going up these stairs and the group follows me. You have to go up the stairs because it's right where Jesus died on the cross, which was on a high hill. And I get to the altar and I'm like, oh my gosh, the altar was, was built into the wall, so I had to face away from the people, and they didn't train us how to do that in the seminary. So I'm like looking at the words, I'm like, when do I turn back, what do I do? It was like right out of seminary, it's like deer in the headlights. And then just as I start, this huge organ down at the bottom of the sepulcher begins booming through the whole mass. The Greek Orthodox Christians were doing their morning prayer and they never do anything small or quiet. And so I'm trying to talk to the people. I'm trying to do this mass while this organ is booming. It was total chaos and yet a complete honor. But the one thing that I remember more than anything else was right next to the altar that I was celebrating at which is the altar used for Roman Catholics. Right over there was the the altar that was used for Greek Orthodox. You know that the Greek Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church have been separated and not in union for a thousand years. But do you know what stood right between those two altars? Churches that had been separated and divided for a thousand years was the Blessed Mother the statue of the Blessed Mother, the Mother of Unity. She stood there on neutral ground. She is the Mother of Unity, always mediating for us to come together. I mean, when you think about that, right? That's what a mediator does. A mediator tries to bring people together. Phil, you remember when you were in sixth grade and you liked that girl in sixth grade, and, and, but you didn't want to like approach her? So you, you, you passed her, you told me about this, right? So you, you, you he's like, what's going on? <laughs> he's like, you passed her a note, right? Or, but you had your friend do it. And, and your friend like passes the girl the note, right? And it says, Phil likes you. Do you like my friend? Yes or no? And of course the answer was yes. I mean, I did that too, but I won't tell you the answer. But, but your friend was a mediator. Like that's happened to most people. And when I was in law, We used to settle a lot of cases through mediation and we'd get there in the morning and 14 hours later we'd have a a dispute would be resolved. No one was really happy about it, but it would be resolved because this mediator would go between these rooms, he would shuttle or she would shuttle back and forth to try to bring us together. That's what Mary wants to do. When she mediates on our behalf, when she prays for us, she wants to bring us together. But her prayers are only going to be fruitful if we learn the lesson of how to come together too. Do you remember that Jesus says in Matthew chapter five, he says that we are supposed to love our enemies, pray for our persecutors, turn the other cheek when we're attacked, give more to the one who tries to steal from us, and go the extra mile when someone tries to oppress us. Why does he say this? Because it softens our hearts. 
and it softens the heart of our enemy. It's all about trying to find common ground by giving in and not fighting all the time. This is Mary's great prayer for us, that we will take that lesson to heart. And when we do, when we're able to do that, then what Mary prayed for in the gospel reading today will finally come true. That the haughty and the arrogant will be cast down and the lowly and the humble and the hungry will be raised up and this world will be a better place. There will be peace and unity for everyone who is willing to cast off their self-righteousness and their need to be right all the time. That's how we come together. In the first reading today, Mary, uh, the, John, the, the disciple John, receives a vision from God. And this vision is of a woman who is giving birth to a ruler, a boy who will rule all the nations. But then right next to her is this big red dragon. Did you hear that in the, in the story? This big red dragon who wants to eat the woman's son because he doesn't like what's happening. Well, you may be surprised to find out that scholars believe, the majority of scholars think that this woman who was clothed with the sun, who had the moon under her feet and wore a crown of 12 stars actually represents Israel, who is trying to bring forth the Messiah, the savior of the world. The 12 stars represent the 12 tribes of Israel, the sun, it refers back to Genesis 37. Anyway, that's what they think. And the dragon is there trying to stop that. And for us as Christians, she represents us, the people of God, trying to bring forth the kingdom, the messianic age of peace and understanding and, and love. But the dragon wants to stop all that. That vision was meant as a promise of hope for the early Christians who were suffering persecution from the Roman emperor. He was the beast. The Roman emperor was the dragon who wanted to crush the Christians. But this vision promised them that they would have victory through Christ. And why I'm telling you this is because this vision can also give us hope for our situation today. The conflicts that we face both outside the church and inside the church, that we will have victory because the woman clothed in the sun, with the moon under her feet, with the stars of 12 stars around her head, is also our mother Mary, who stands at the right hand of Jesus and prays for us always to be one. Brothers and sisters, as you come forward today to receive the sacred body and blood of Christ at this altar, please don't make the same mistake that the Corinthians did. It's not just about you and Jesus. Discern the body. The people around you, the community here, the people outside, the people who need to hear about Jesus, the people who are unchurched, the people who are enemies, the people who don't like the church, the people who talk bad about the church, your own personal enemies. Discern the body so that you can grow in greater unity with others. Only when each of us can do that only when we can humbly mediate on behalf of others like Mary does for us will the church which is torn by strife and division and ever in need of reform finally be healed.